Well, I guess uh, the movies. <clears throat> when I saw King Kong and Frankenstein and movies like that, I was uh, totally captivated. I, anything that was bigger than life and very imaginative, I loved. I also loved things that were realistic if they were well done. I remember a movie like Inherit the Wind and things of that sort. Um, basically, I love stories that grab you, where you're interested in the characters and you want to know what's going to happen. And the more unusual the story, obviously, the more fun it is. I think mainly just because I read a lot and I loved going to the movies. Because when I was a kid, <clears throat> we didn't have much money and going to the movies was expensive. If I was lucky, I could go once a week on Saturday and see a picture. And the books I read, um, I loved to read. In fact, one of the best presents my mother ever got for me was a little book stand so I could keep the book on it while I was eating. You know, and there's a little bar, you could turn the page and the bar held the page where it should be. Um, she used to say that if I didn't have anything to read when I was eating, I'd read the label of the ketchup bottle. I, I had to be reading all the time. <laughs> and who were your storytelling heroes then? What were your favorite books? Oh gosh, uh, everything I read. I read The Hardy Boys by Franklin W. Dixon. I still remember his name. I read Tarzan. I read. Um, Sherlock Holmes, I, re I read everything. Um, any type of fantasy or any type of reality of realism that was well written and that made you get into the characters, you know, Jules Verne, things like that. Well, I never tried to write my own characters but I did a lot of writing when I was in school. I did all sorts of composition. Every time there was a composition class, I knocked myself out to get the best composition. And um, I wrote little poems for the magazine, for our official magazine, things like that. Nobody ever asked me to write stories or to create characters. Um, but writing was always fun. In fact, I remember when I was about 12, 13 years old, I was a very corny guy. I, I, I had a little briefcase and I loved carrying it with me when I walked in the street so that people would think I was a writer, you know, a little thin briefcase. This one thing I did do, and I had forgotten about it, I just remember now, I used to tell myself stories and what I would do is I'd take a piece of paper and I would draw a horizontal line and that was the, um, that was the ground. And then I would draw little stick figure characters and I would move them around. I'd have one character with a white hat. He'd punch the character with the black hat that <laughs> was the villain. And I told myself little stories on that line that I drew. I, ha I, I had forgotten about that, but I did that a lot. So those were your those were the first characters created by Stan Lee, really. Probably. The good guy and the bad guy. Yeah, oh, there had to be a bad guy for right. the good guy to fight. I guess when I went to work for Marvel, which then was called Timely Comics, it was the very early 1940s, and um, I had a job there as I was sort of the office boy. I, in fact, I didn't know I was going to be doing comics. It was a publishing company, and I heard they wanted, they had, there was a job open for an assistant. Now, they also published men's magazines, movie magazines, sport magazines, and they had a little comic book section somewhere that I, I, I was hardly aware of. So I applied for the job and I found out it was for the comic book department. And there were only two people running that department, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. And I started working for them. I filled the ink wells. In those days, people used ink. And I erased pages and I went down and got them sandwiches for lunch and stuff like that. After a while, they left, and it had been a three-man department, and now I was the only man left. And the, I was about 17 and a half, and the 
publisher came over to me and said, do you think you can keep things going till I find a grown-up, you know, to, to run the place? Well, when you're 17 and a half, what do you know? I said, sure, I can handle it. So I guess I did, because he never found that grown-up, and I was there ever since. And that's when I started writing stories. Tell me your <laughs> recollection of the first story. Do you remember that first story? I really don't. No? I made up a lot of characters. I remember one was called the Destroyer. I couldn't tell you who he was or what he was now, but I remember the name. As long as a story had a lot of action, there, as long as there were a lot of fight scenes, he felt I was giving him a good story. So I was very good at putting in fight scenes because I had drawn all those little fight scenes on the straight line with my little stick figures. <laughs> which character, or which story, makes you was the first one where you felt I'm onto something here? I'm not just writing fight scenes for a dollar. I, I got something here. I guess the first Fantastic Four story, because that was the first one that I wrote <clears throat> the way I really wanted to write it. Up until then, I was just trying to please my publisher, and he had no respect at all for the readers. He thought they were either very, very young children or semi-literate adults, and he felt, just give them action, that's all they want. So with the Fantastic Four, I tried to do some character development. I gave each one his own distinctive way of speaking, things like that. And that was not what my publisher had wanted. And the reason I did it was I was thinking of quitting at that point. And my wife said to me, before you quit, why don't you get it out of your system? Do one story the way you'd want to. The worst that could happen, he'll fire you, but you want to quit anyway. So that's when I did the Fantastic Four. And strangely enough, it sold very well. So my publisher came in and he said, hey, how about doing some more superheroes? And that's when I did, I don't even remember the order, the X-Men, the Hulk, Daredevil, you know, and on and on. Before we did the superheroes, we published Westerns. And I tried to write westerns a little bit like High Noon, but um, nobody was reading them much, and I couldn't put too much in because I always had to make sure there were a lot of gunfights. It was the Fantastic Four where I really went all out in trying to do it the way I wanted to do it. I've always been interested in characterization. As I told you, I loved Sherlock Holmes because I felt I knew him, the way he was written. And any good book that I read, I felt I knew the characters. When I read, I was too young to appreciate all of it, but when I read Les Miserables, and I read about Javert, and poor Cosette, and Jean Valjean, I mean, I knew those characters, and I wanted to do characters that the people, the reader would think he or she knew. Um, if a character had a superpower, that was fine. You could enjoy that and understand it. But I used to think, what about their personal life? What about when they're not chasing the bad guy? See, with Superman, I really knew nothing about him except when he took off his glasses, people said, oh, you're Superman. But I didn't know where he lived. I didn't know what were his personal problems and so forth. So I wanted to get characters who, even though they had superpower, they had personal problems and they had ambitions and frustrations and so forth. I felt I wanted my characters to be like Sherlock Holmes in the sense that the reader would know them and find them interesting. Well, you're right. And with great power, you always have to have that flaw, that weakness. Or there's no tension, there's no... That's right. That's great storytelling. Because except for me, there's probably nobody who's 100% perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I nailed them all, because I, I forgot to tell you, I'm also my biggest fan. <laughs> but um, probably Spider-Man is the one I would have to say, because... Um, he seems to be the most popular, and 
in some incredible way. He has become as well known around the world as Mickey Mouse or anybody. So I'd have to go with Spider-Man. What do you think it is about that character that resonates? Well, again, I think a lot of people, especially young people, were able to um, identify with him. I've been told that. I go to a lot of comic book conventions and talk to a lot of fans, and they're always telling me, gee, Spider-Man was great. I, I, I thought I could be like Peter Parker, you know. And that made me feel real good. I'll never forget when I told my publisher that I wanted to do a teenage superhero. He said, you're out of your mind. Teenagers can only be sidekicks. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Oh, and he also said, you can't call a character Spider-Man. People hate spiders. What's the matter with you? Then when I told him I wanted Spider-Man to have problems, Stan, don't you know what a superhero is? <laughs> it was funny. It wasn't an easy sell. Well, all that I ever did, <clears throat> I guess I'm a very conceited guy, because I only tried to please myself. In other words, I would try to think of a character that I would want to read about. So many writers I have found, because I've worked with a lot of writers and hired a lot of writers, they write for an audience. like. I'm going to write this story for people between 20 and 35 years old, or I'm going to write this for the people who are in their older teens, let's say from 16 to 20. I never felt that way. I was always writing stories for me. If, I, if it was something that wouldn't interest me, why should I inflict it on somebody else? As far as writing for certain age groups, I always tried to keep the writing clear enough so that a youngster could understand it. And if occasionally there was a word he didn't get and he had to look it up in a dictionary, that isn't the worst thing that would happen. Although usually, if you're a reader, you come across a word you don't know, you can figure out what it means by osmosis, by its use in the sentence, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, I just tried to write what I would like to read, keep it simple enough for somebody young, and try to keep it intelligent enough for somebody older. Mm -hmm. And I never gave it much conscious thought. I mean, I'm, I'm saying it that way for you because you're asking for an explanation, but all I was thinking about was, gee, I'll bet it would be fun if this happened. And oh yeah, and then if he met this guy, but this guy didn't know he was, yeah, and I'd write, you know, it was just, I was interesting myself. I was, to me, it was like, if it's a movie, this is the next scene I'd like to see. And then, then I'd like this to happen. So I was always just writing for me. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, that is great advice because we can second guess forever trying to please others. And in the end, you'll have been striving to please others your whole life. And that's yeah, I have no time. idea what your preferences are or yours or yours, but I know what I like, so at least I can be true to myself. Well, and you also received uh, a wonderful confirmation that your vision was working. Uh, and I think, I'm sure that bed... I was lucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was always looking to do something different. I, I didn't want to give the readers the same old stuff, and I didn't want to give my publisher the same old stuff. He was looking for different things. So I thought, I remembered I had always loved the movie Frankenstein. And to me, the monster wasn't a villain. He didn't want to hurt anybody, but he was always being chased up and down those hills by those idiots with torches, you know? So I thought, why not get a guy who's a monster, sort of, but he's really good, but nobody understands. So then I thought, well, it's going to be tough doing story after story just about a monster. And I remember Jekyll and Hyde. I thought, gee, what if this monster was really, could really change into a normal man? And what if the normal man hated the monster and the monster hated his normal self, who he thought, thought was weak. Then I have conflict, and I have a situation where I can base a lot of stories on. So that's what I did. I, I, I loved writing the Hulk, 
And uh, I'm not very scientifically inclined. I had to find a reason for him to become the Hulk. So I decided that his human identity, Dr. Bruce Banner, would um, be hit by a gamma ray. I have no idea what a gamma ray is, <laughs> but it sounded good. <laughs> Just like the Fantastic Four, they were inundated by cosmic ray. I wouldn't know a cosmic ray if it was in front of me, but again, it sounded scientific. <laughs> Take Superman. He flies, right? Well, all he does is go like this, and he's flying. No visible means of propulsion, but when I had the Hulk sort of flying. It's because he could leap very far with an explanation. Or Thor. Thor had a hammer. He twirled it around. It was attached to his wrist. It went fast as a propeller. When he let it go, it took off, and it took him with him. So Marvel has always been scientifically accurate as opposed <laughs> to our competitors. Uh -huh. It was so easy for me because getting those characters, the stories almost wrote themselves. We have Magneto, who is every bit as intelligent as Professor X and had this great power, and he didn't feel he was a villain, and I didn't feel he was a villain. He just felt the X-Men are the next step in human evolution and they should rule the world. Professor X felt no, you've got to work together with the humans and so forth. And I tried to make it a little treatise about bigotry and about tolerance and things like that. Funny thing about it, though, at that point, again, my publisher asked me to come up with another group of characters. He said, we're doing well with the Fantastic Four. Let's get another group. Now, the toughest thing is where do they get their powers from? How am I going to get a whole group of characters and each one gets a power and... I had run out of rays. After gamma rays and cosmic <laughs> rays, I don't know any more rays. So I thought I would take the cowardly way out, and I'd say they were born that way. They were mutants. And that was cowardly on my part, but it worked. So I went to my publisher, and I said, I got this new book for you. It's great. It's, I call it The Mutants. And he said, you can't use that name. I said, why? He said, our readers won't know what a mutant is. He didn't have much respect for our readership. I said, of course they will. Mutant, it's a common word. He said, no, I don't want to call them the mutants. Get me another name. So I went back and I thought, and I realized that they have an extra power, and the leader is called Professor Xavier. I'll call him the X-Men. So I went back and I said, how about the X-Men? He said, yeah, that sounds good. So when I left the office, I thought to myself, if nobody would know what a mutant is, how the hell are they going to know what an X-Man is? <laughs> but I had my title, and I wasn't going to question them. I was trying to think of something stronger than... I wanted to get the strongest superhero anybody had, and I figured, why not a god? So everybody knew that Roman gods and the Greek gods I figure most people aren't that familiar with the uh, Norse gods, so I did a little reading about them, and it was fascinating. Thor and Odin, and Odin had one eye and all that, and Loki. So I figured we'll, we'll do them. And I love adjectives. I wasn't just going to call it Thor. It was the mighty Thor. Now, when I started it, it was different than the way it is now. When I started it, he was a doctor who walked with a cane, and um, I forget what happened, but he ended up in Norway, and he saw this hammer stuck in a stone with a message that said, if only he who is worthy will be able to lift the hammer. And something happened. There were bad guys chasing the doctor, who was very good. I made a point of showing what a good guy he was. And he ran into this cave, and there was the hammer, and he needed a weapon to fight the bad guys. He reached for it, and it, he picked it out of the stone right away, and he became Thor. And later, whenever he hit the hammer on the ground, he would turn back into this lame doctor who walked with a cane. And the cane became the hammer of Thor every time he hit it. And he was in love with a nurse on Earth, but he was also in love with the goddess Sif, Sif in Asgard. 
and sometimes later on, we would learn that Nurse Jane and Sif were the same person, that Odin had put a replica of Sif on Earth for the doctor who was really Thor. And I had a whole complicated thing in my mind. But after a while, I stopped writing the book. Other people took it over, and they sort of forgot all about that beginning. To speak to that, I think that that's a problem, because the problem, I, and, I, and I always enjoyed Thor, but the problem I had was that he was God, and I never really knew his personal life. He had the Superman problem a little bit hmm. after oh, you oh, left yeah. the book, where they didn't have the weakness, they didn't have what you had done, which was the, the doctor who had transformed. Yeah, it's funny, I hadn't really thought about that till this interview, but you're right, they, they, they did they leave that out. Yeah, and he became... But he's a great character, and what I tried to do was get interesting characters with him. I loved, he had three friends called the Warriors Three, I think. There was um, Volstag the Voluminous, yes. this big fat warrior who was the kind of guy who said, I'll hold your coat, you fight him. <laughs> and then there was um, somebody, the Balder the Brave, I think, yes. who I modeled after uh, Errol Flynn. And there was Hogan the Grim, I think that was his name. He had had a tragedy in his life and he never smiled. And he, But the three of them were good friends of Thor's and mm -hmm. I loved using them. And then there was Heimdall who guarded the Rainbow Bridge. I loved that Rainbow Bridge from Earth to Asgard. And of course the father, Odin. Um, yeah, no, I, I loved writing Thor because I could also use thee and thou's and that kind of flowery <laughs> language. <laughs> Thou shalt not. <coughs>because by having super sensitive hearing, your balance is in your ears, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, and he could read something, and even though he was blind, he could read a book by running his finger over the page because his fingers were so sensitive they could read the ink. Mm -hmm. So, and he was a good guy, and I tried to make him nice and cheerful and uh, had a lot of fun with his partner, Foggy Nelson, when they did the movie, they made it too tragic and too grim, and I, I, I felt they, it wasn't really the daredevil that I had thought of. But I loved the character. I, that was one of my favorite mm. uh, titles, and I, I love that one because um, it was really, I love the mob, the kingpin. It was a different kind of world. It was mm -hmm. a... A great, it was a grittier world on a smaller scale. Yeah, the villains were just regular gangsters and stuff like that. Yeah. There was the kingpin. Um, it's funny because I was a little afraid after I did Daredevil. I thought maybe blind people would object. Maybe, you know, what the hell are you trying to do? When we're blind, we can't do those things. But I got a lot of mail from charities like the Lighthouse for the Blind and Seeing Eye. And they said, we read those stories to, to our people and they love them. And that made me feel so good, you know. Of course, great entertainment is aspirational and it gives us something to yeah. reach for. Yeah. I love that character. Well, the first one that I remember was um, a very poor version of Captain America as, as a movie. Then there was a television, a short-lived Spider-Man television series where they did everything wrong, everything. I'll never forget, I think it was CBS, I'm not sure, but I called a meeting. I wanted to tell them what I felt they were doing wrong with the show. So I was sitting around a conference table with a lot of big wigs from the network and the screenwriter. And I said, you know, you're not playing up his personality and you're not doing this and you're not doing that. And when I got all through, they thanked me very much for being there. Nothing was changed. And I got a note from the writer saying, I appreciate your comments, but I can't fly by the seat of Stan Lee's pants. That was the comment I got. And the show went off the air a few weeks later. Um, 
But then we did Blade, and that was a hit. That was the first time we did something that was really a hit. Uh, it wasn't my character, but it didn't matter. He was the vampire hunter. We had a great script, a good actor. Everything was good about it. We did a sequel, Blade Two, I believe. And then there was a long low when nothing happened, and then along came, I think it was the X-Men was the first one. And after that, we were off and running. Daredevil, I felt, didn't quite capture it. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, but it was good as a movie. But aside from that, I thought they were all absolutely wonderful, every one of them. There were things I would have maybe suggested changing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't think Dr. Doom was done right in the Fantastic Four. I thought in the first um, Hulk movie, the Hulk was too big. Um, things like that, but, but they were all good. They were well-made movies. Um, I, I think Marvel could be proud of every one of them. Uh, which is your, if, if I had to ask you, there have been three versions of, big screen versions of the Hulk now. I Eric think the, Banna, late, the latest Norton, one. The, your favorite the from the one. Avengers? Yeah. Mark Ruffalo as yeah. Bruce Banner? Just like they got Iron Man so right with them. Um, Robert Downey Jr. I mean, he was born to play Tony Stark. Yes. And there was a big question before it came out. Is we really out of Tony Jr.? But he just, I can't imagine anyone else in that no, role. No, he, he is Tony Stark. Yep. Um, w let's go backwards because we missed it. What about uh, Bill Bixby's <clears throat> television show? Oh, I forgot about that. That was wonderful. That was directed and written by Kenneth, I forget his last name, but he was brilliant. He was smart enough not to have the Hulk speak. You know, when I used to write the stories, the Hulk would say, me smash or Hulk smash, you know. I, I needed some dialogue balloon to throw in, <laughs> but he knew it would sound corny, so he didn't have the Hulk speak at all. And he had Bill Bixby playing David Banner, and Lou Ferrigno was perfect as the monster, and the stories were good, and you only saw the Hulk for about maybe three minutes in the whole half hour, but you waited it, and women went mad. When there was that scene where his shoulders, the, the shirt started to tear and his shoulder was getting big, everything about it, it was a good show. A very good show. I agree. I felt that show had <coughs> emotional depth. I yeah. really cared. You cared for him. He was always, he was a fugitive in many ways. It was a very adult uh, approach. And the it. idea that both of them hated each other. <coughs> Banner wanted to get rid of the Hulk, and the Hulk hated Banner because he was weak, and they were the same man. It was like that other thing I talked about um, I forget what, Frankenstein, but the, mm -hmm. what was the movie you, you uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde, yes. yes. So it, it worked so well. Well, I enjoy them. It, it happened, I think, with the first X-Men movie. He said, hey, how would you like to be in one of the scenes? So I was in the background selling hot dogs on a beach when the senator walked by. I was just, you just saw me for a second. But that was fun. And then um, for the Spider-Man movie, I was asked if I would do a cameo. And all I did was I was standing in the crowd. Something was happening up above, and I went like that. <laughs> and it wasn't a lot. But little by little on the cameos, they started giving me more and more to do. And some of them I actually had a line to say. In fact, I have two new ones coming out now, one in the Captain America movie, I think it is and one in the new Spider-Man movie. And they're very brief, very simple, but uh, I enjoy doing them. I, the reason I like them is because so often in, our, in the entertainment industry, the writer is just, and from the beginning, you were a presence in those books. I'd open up the comic book and there was a note from you. <laughs> and you know, I love that. Be, writers don't often get that You're credit. Right. You're right. And to, for you to be in your films is another way of 
reminding people, you know, there was a source here, and it was one man. No, I'd rather it reminds people how good an actor I am. All right, to each his own. <laughs>
and I would look at them and they were terrible. And I would think to myself, if you don't have a good enough eye to know that these samples are badly drawn, you're not going to make it as an artist. But I never knew how to word that, how to say that to the poor guy. So I would say, well, maybe you should just keep studying. You know, you need a little more thought for your anatomy and something. But an artist should be able to tell if his artwork is good. You should have an eye. And a writer should be able to know, after he writes a paragraph, he should read it and say, yeah, hey, that's pretty good. Or, that's pretty dull. You've got to be able to edit your own material. And you've got to have that kind of taste. And if you don't, you should try to get into another field because without that sort of ability to know whether something is well-written and interesting written or not, then um, it's tough to make it in the field of, of writing or any creative field. So That's it's about as serious as I've been for five minutes. Excelsior, which means upward and onward to greater glory. <laughs>